God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. The creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise. Don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath. Evolving in pursuit of what you said If it all reveals your nature, so will I I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace If creation still obeys you, so will I So will I. If the stars are made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roll your greatness, so will I. For if everything resists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sun of all our praises still fall shy, and we'll sing again a hundred billion times. God of salvation, you chase down my heart. All of my failure and pride On a hill you created The light of the world Abandoned in darkness to die And as you speak A hundred billion failures disappear where you lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part designed in a work of art called love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart a billion different ways 
Every precious one, a child you died to save. You gave your life to love them so alive. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, 
morning and welcome to the online worship at Christchurch Warminster. As you can see, I'm not in Warminster at the moment, I'm not at home at Vicarage. I'm here at, in Salisbury because I've just been to Caroline R. New Curate's ordination service as so she's been ordained deacon this morning. It's really uh, wonderful and I'm going to show you some um, pictures of that in a moment, which I hope you'll really enjoy. Please do join us after the service on Zoom if you're able to this morning as we come to the very end of our sermon series, Parables, Stories Jesus Told. Before we begin our worship proper this morning, let us pray. Faithful one whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer and shape our lives for the kingdom of your son, our saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I lead us this morning in our call to worship, I want to encourage you to respond physically, to stand if you're able. As we come together to worship the one who gave himself for us. We worship together at home, online, in church, to offer our praise and thanksgiving. Lift up your hands high as an act of praise. We worship together at home, online, in church, to hear and receive God's holy word. Arrange the upward facing palms of your hands in front of your body shaped as a V formation, like the opening pages of a book. We worship together at home, online, in church, to pray for the needs of the world. Put your hands together, palm to palm, and fingers pointing upwards as for prayer. We worship together at home, online, in church, that we would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Link your thumbs and gently flap your fingers as wings imitating a dove, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. We worship together at home, online, in church, that we may give ourselves to the service of God. 
put both hands across your heart and then move them outward in a gesture of self-giving. We offer ourselves to the one who gave his very self for us. Come, let us worship. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore. Heart that is broken, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour. I was looking for a specific photograph the other day on the computer and I happened to come across this one of a young sparrow just fled from a nest at the hedge of the bottom of our gardens and after taking a bath, perching on the edge of it in front of his creator. It brought the thought to mind, this should be ourselves. Coming as we are, washed clean, standing in front of the same creator God. But before we petition God with our prayers, let us confess and cleanse our hearts and minds of all our wrongdoings and inappropriate things we have said and seek his forgiveness. 
So let us just take a few moments of quiet to do just that. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from wrong that we have thought, said and done, and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of your Son Jesus who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. Give us grace, Almighty Father, to address you with our hearts as well as our lips. Teach us to fix our thoughts on you, so that our prayers are not in vain, but are acceptable to you now and always. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We thank you, Jesus, that you were sent to us to fulfil scriptures and not to supersede them, that the laws you gave to Moses, what we call the commandments, are your rules, and that we should live our lives to the best of our ability in accordance with these scriptures. Thank you, Lord, in the way you look after our well-being and help us to trust you more, especially at this time, a time of uncertainty and fear caused by the escalation of infection of the coronavirus, not only in this country, but worldwide. Give our government wisdom to make the right decisions, as the situation is now getting seemingly worse. We also ask that you instill in those people who selfishly and blatantly ignore advice given about ways of reducing the risk of spreading the virus. We pray too for the scientists as they strive to produce an effective vaccine. Give the researchers at Oxford University further encouragement as the news now tells us they seem to have made a minor breakthrough. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift to the Lord those who are known to us or ill or mourning the death of a loved one. Please hold their names in your hearts and touch each one, we pray, with your healing hand. Give strength to those in pain. Hold the weak in the arms of your love and give hope and patience to those who are recovering. Reach down, we pray, and lift them up into your gentle arms. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who live in darkness and for those with broken hopes, broken homes or broken relationships, for those in prison for their crimes, the families of those murdered or imprisoned for their faith, tortured or spirits broken by injustice, for the millions of refugees today displaced or driven out from their homeland, searching for a new home and security in another country. We also pray today for the homeless in their vulnerability, asking for a welcome, the rich in their emptiness longing for acceptance, the lonely in their busyness crying for community, the families in their arguments praying for peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you may unseen at our side. We wash the feet of his friends. And we who follow in your footsteps, we are here waiting for you to follow, to suggest signs of sharing, to make us into your servants of your gospel. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Father God, hear our prayers today and help us where and when we can be the answer to someone else's prayer. Amen. And drawing our prayers and praises into one, we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In the
Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. And the reading is from Luke chapter 18, 1 to 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones, who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, He will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, 
Will he find faith on earth? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I have a younger brother, Chris. He lives in Los Angeles and this year he has encountered a deluge of problems. He has Parkinson's disease and that's progressed so much so that he's had to give up his job. And that's in spite of a large mortgage and not much savings. The area that he lives in has been hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic, meaning he and his wife, who has also got medical issues, are unable to go out much. Then he received a possible emergency eviction order about two weeks ago because the fires behind his house looked as though they were going to come down and sweep over all the land around them. And then last week, our family messenger group, we got the message, earthquake, capital letters with an exclamation mark at the end. Los Angeles is on the San Andreas fault line and it can cause huge earthquakes. Fortunately, this one was a smaller one. We're still waiting for the big one. Underneath the entry earthquake, one of the younger members of the family had written, Chris, it seems like the end of the world. So what's this got to do with the parable of the persistent widow? Well, chapter divisions in the Bible aren't always helpful. And this parable is directly linked to the discussion that Jesus has just been having with his disciples about the end of the world, the parousia, the coming of the kingdom of God. A Pharisee had just asked Jesus when the kingdom of God, God would come. And Jesus explained to him that he would not see it come as such, but that the kingdom of God was already in their midst. He then turns to the disciples and discusses with them what it's going to be like for them on the, before the day when the Son of Man is revealed. There will be many trials and tribulations. Indeed, as Luke writes his gospel, this is the predicament that the disciples find themselves in. Life is very uncomfortable with persecutions and ordeals for them. This reminder of Jesus's words would have been very reassuring. Jesus had predicted the challenges and pain that was to come. The Bible then says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable. It reminds me of the children at primary school who keep writing, and then this happened, and then something else happened, and then just to link their sentences and thoughts together. This parable is clearly linked to the discussion they have just had. So with that in mind, let's unpack the parable a bit more. Jesus tells them that in spite of all the things that are going to happen, they should always pray and not give up. To illustrate this, he gives a picture to us of a judge who is clearly not God, indeed the opposite of God. The Jewish hearers would have been shocked to hear of a judge that had the reverse of the characteristics that they would expect. He is not God-fearing and he doesn't care what anyone else thinks about him. However, he's being pestered by a woman. A woman who is incredibly vulnerable, as a widow would have been in those times. She would have been severely limited in what she was able to achieve. She wants justice over some matter. We're not told what that was, but in those days it would have been very difficult for her to achieve that by herself. So she is badgering and badgering him, wearing him down totally, so that in the end, to shut her up, he gives her what she wants. And Jesus says, Look at the example of what happens here with an unjust, unscrupulous judge. How much more would God, who is our loving Father, ensure that justice will be done to those that cry out to him? And then he leaves us with a tantalising question. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So how do we interpret this parable today? Is it that we should keep praying to God and badgering him to get what we want? Badgering until we get it? 
Will your prayer only be answered if you pray it three times a day, seven days a week for a month? Is one type of prayer more effective than another? Does God only move to help those in trouble if we pray? I don't think so. This is not the character of God that we see shining through the Bible. This is not the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but should have eternal life, as it says in John. What is Jesus asking us to do here, if it is not to keep badgering God? God recognises that we're going to go through some awful times. His kingdom, after all, has not arrived yet. And we are to pray for that. As we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So just let's think a bit deeper about prayer. Why on earth do we pray at all? We pray because we believe in God. We pray because we recognise that God is good. We pray because everything we know about God points to love. We pray because we want to be reconciled to God. We pray because we want to be the hands and feet of God. We pray that because we believe with the Holy Spirit's help, we can move ourselves and others and our society nearer to the fullness of the kingdom of God. And I'm sure you've got other thoughts about why you pray yourself. I came across a deeply unsettling book by Mark Carris. He's an ordained pastor and therapist. He challenges our understanding of prayer. He asks searching questions about what we are thinking to achieve as we pray to God. Are we asking him to change? Are we telling him what's best for someone? Are we telling him what to do when he is infinitely more wise than we are? He suggests that we should be praying in order to conspire with God. Conspire. Try and forget the negative connotation of the word and think of it as the definition says to breathe together, to act, to move towards a common end. He suggests that we should strive in prayer to create space in our busy lives, to align our hearts with God's heart so that our hearts can be harmoniously together and where we plot together to subversively overcome evil with acts of good and love. For him, it is not, hey God, you do it. It is, how can we do it? And we join in with what God is already doing. He urges the church today to use conspiring prayer, praying not to change God, but to change us. Some of the stories in his book are hugely helpful in forming our ideas and opinions, and you may not agree with them all. He's from a very dysfunctional family, he has a brother in prison for murder and his mother died of a drug overdose. He found faith as a teenager in a Pentecostal community, which regularly prayed for him and his family. Their prayer was for God to fix the family, but he suggests that if the church had prayed in a conspiring way, maybe things could have been very different. Rather than praying, God fix them, Sharing their heart with God could have girded them into action or prompted them to specific Bible verses for encouragement or changed them into thinking in different ways about the family's problems. So if I agree with his thinking, how does that affect the prayer that I have for my brother? Well, I believe that God is always seeking to heal and restore and deliver my brother. He loves my brother. I know that he wants the best for him and that he would want him healed. I do not need to say that, but I need to conspire with him. So firstly, I share my heart with God. This is what I came up with. <clears throat> 
Oh, Father, I am sick to my stomach. I can't imagine what my brother is going through. His worry about his health getting worse, his becoming more immobile, the fact that he is less able to talk, his financial burdens, the pandemic, fires, earthquakes around him. It just all seems too much. But thank you, God, that you love him and want him healed. I know our hearts ache together over him. Please guide me. Give me words and pictures that will encourage him. Help me to discern what action I can take for him. Move me to that action. And then when I have finished with the words, I wait with God. But I'm in a mindset of listening and doing something for him together with God. So back to our persistent widow. She may be vulnerable, but she does not give up and do nothing. She is full of action. She nags away to see an injustice resolved. Richard Raw, a contemporary theologian, sees the crux of this parable as the importance of staying in dialogue with God. People who enter this dialogue will change. If you persist in prayer, you will change. Your own intention, motivation and understanding changes. He gives an example of praying for a sick grandmother. Firstly, you may pray, God, heal my grandmother. But over time and with dialogue with God, the prayer adjusts. If it be your will, if that is what grandmother needs. And somehow through the changes, it leads us to trust that our prayer is being heard. You are being changed. Now, finally, what about that last question posed by Jesus? However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Or put in a different way, will he find anyone who trusts God today? I don't think any one of us would be here today, either virtually or in this church building, if we didn't want to be with these people, if we didn't want to be those people. Those people who little by little are edged into a bigger frame, into a bigger picture, into a bigger understanding, a more in-depth understanding of what you yourself are praying for. So the more we pray, the more we will become wise, more compassionate, more understanding people, with a heart to be God's hands and feet. Prayer is not to talk God into things. Prayer is to change us. People who pray a lot, change a lot. Isn't that what Jesus is telling us to do in this parable? Amen. Thank you for that message, Caroline. I'm struck that often what gets in the way of us spending time in prayer is the busyness of life. So let's not rush on, but stop. Turn away from distractions now and seek God. I will use some words from Psalm 27 to help shape this time and we'll leave a good deal of space. Fill this with your prayers and most of all, let's use this time to seek God, to align our hearts with his and as Caroline said, to breathe together. So let's focus our hearts with Psalm 27 verse 4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple.
made me think like Caroline and her brother of a loved one you wish to pray for. Seek God's wisdom. Seek the Lord's direction now. As Psalm 27 verse 7 says, Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. I wonder if now or during the service, God gave you a word or a picture. Take a moment to hold this in your mind. Maybe thank God and ask for his heart in this now. As we move from prayer, help us into action in our everyday, Lord. Let these words from the end of Psalm 27 be real in our lives this week. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord bless you. to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Shine upon you and a thousand generations, your family and your children, and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your Rejoicing, he is for you, he is for you. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family and your children and the children and the children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, he is with you in the morning. In the evening, in the coming and the going, in your evening, rejoicing is for you, is for you. Amen. 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 Amen.
go about the rest of our day let us pray Lord we all know what it's like to feel tired and discouraged so deeply that it is hard to pray any longer hard to hold out hope some of us are in that place right now strengthen those of us who are weary that no one would lose heart that together we would experience the life-giving hope that only comes from you as we trust in your promises. Amen. We pray God's blessing upon us. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. And the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.